Hey everybody, it's Amy, and I'm back with another Dueling Rabbits Productions video about woven structures on the draw loom. Today's topic is that most elegant of textiles, satin damask. As I sit at the studio's new Ula Cyrus, contemplating the vertical jacks before me and weaving away on five-end satin damask, I've been asking myself lots of questions. Why do I need to use my draw loom's countermarch to weave the structure? Why do my pattern blocks look different than they do when I weave them on a single harness setup? Will I ever use my beloved damask pulleys again? To answer these and other burning questions, we need to understand satin damask tie-ups and the requirements for, and tasty mathematics behind, both regular and irregular satin structures. So buckle up! It's fascinating stuff, but we've got a lot to get through. If you hadn't already gathered, I think satin damask is amazing. With the predictable interlacement of one warp and one weft, straight threading and straight treadling, we get lustrous, elegant cloth with long floats that shimmer in candlelight. There are no strong diagonals, as there are in most twills, to distract the eye from the textile's smooth surface. When woven on a draw loom, original, figurative patterns challenge our imaginations and add infinite complexity to the simple ground cloth beneath. There are several sources for draw loom weavers seeking tie-up diagrams and the explanations behind them. Isn't it satisfying to work from first principles? In this video, we are going to focus primarily on five-end and six-end satin to consider many things. Satin as a unit weave, the satin counter as it informs our structure, the impact of clean cuts on our designs, and the implications of all these factors for damask tie-ups. If you are new to draw looms or would like to understand the basics of how damask is woven on them, I encourage you first to watch last year's video about four-end twill damask draw loom mechanics 101. But now, let's spend a little time considering what makes satin satin before adding damask pattern blocks to the mix. The satin structure consists of one warp and one weft, interlacing in small, identical square repeats that march both sideways and up and down to form the cloth. These repeats have many names, but I always think of them as units. There are many satins, and we distinguish them by referring to their unit size. Unit size equates to the number of warp ends needed to weave it. The structure's interlacement scheme means it is also the number of shafts required. Five-end satin has units of five warp ends and requires five shafts. Here's one unit with its five orange warp ends and five blue weft picks. Eight-end satin has units of eight warp ends and requires eight shafts. Here's an eight by eight unit. And so on, with all the possibilities this scheme affords us. Satins are usually woven on a straight threading with straight treadling as we've seen in these examples. The structure is provided by the tie-up. This is a key point to which we will soon return. Now let's examine a unit in more detail using our five-end satin as a starting point. Here's the cloth reduced to one possible unit, five orange warp threads and five blue weft threads. We can see that each row of our unit contains one interlacement only and that each interlacement is unique. The interlacements are scattered evenly throughout the unit. One side of the unit is weft dominant. In each row, only one of the five warp ends is raised, giving us long, horizontal floats that pass over four warp threads each. The side opposite is warp dominant, because each warp end passes over four weft threads between each interlacement. Now, the placement of the interlacements is crucial. For each unit, no two interlacement points can be adjacent to one another because that would give us twill diagonals and defeat the purpose of our structure. We can't have interlacements repeated within the unit because that messes up our even distribution. And we have to have an interlacement in every row or our cloth will fall apart. How do we meet these criteria without running to a book 
for a tie-up diagram. Well, the placement of each interlacement is determined in a way that is reassuringly predictable. It is governed by a constant we call the satin counter, the number of ends the interlacement shifts from one pick to the next. There are four rules for the counter which work on the basis of elimination and are pretty easy to remember. The satin counter can't be the same as the number of ends in each unit because that would mean the shift would bring us back to where we started. It can't be the same as the unit number minus 1 because that would give us 12. It can't be a number that has common factors with the unit count and we'll see why in a minute. Finally, it can't be 1 which would also give us 12. So let's return to our 5 end satin example and figure this out. Rule number 1 says our counter can't be 5, because that's the number of ends in our unit. Rule number 2 says our counter can't be 4, because 5 minus 1 is 4. Rule 3 doesn't apply because 5 is a prime number. And rule 4 says the counter can never be 1. So by a process of elimination, we see our counter can only be 2 or 3. Here on the left is a weft dominant unit with a satin counter of 3. We'll start here and count over to the next interlacement. 1, 2, 3. There it is. 1, 2, 3. There's the next one. 1, 2, 3. And 1, 2, 3. On the reverse warp dominant face, the counter is 2. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. We can do it the other way around for another 5 end satin unit that also obeys all our rules. Here is our weft dominant face with a satin counter of 2 rather than 3. 1, 2, 1, 2. 1, 2, 1, 2. Our warp dominant face has a satin counter of 3. All these units are 5N satin because they fulfill the criteria for our structure. Because the satin counter is consistent within the unit, 5N satin is considered a regular satin. Let's try it with 8N satin to make sure. For our 8 end satin counter, we eliminate 8 because that's our unit number. 7 because 8 minus 1 is 7. 2, 4, and 6 because they all share factors with 8. And 1. It can only be 3 or 5. We can see that in these examples. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And our alternate unit with 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. Our warp dominant units show the opposite to their weft dominant counterparts. 8N satin is another regular satin because the same counter governs every interlacement in each unit. This is a good time to see what happens if we ignore rule number three, the one about common factors. As an example, let's choose two for our counter and see what happens. Things seem to be proceeding according to plan until interlacement number five, when I start repeating myself. Several warps are never interlacing with the weft, which would cause ruination and despair to my weaving. Let's do 6N satin next because it's my favorite on the draw loom. In 6N satin, the counter can't be 6, or 5, or 2, 3, or 4, or 1. It has to be... Oops. Our rules have eliminated every possibility. There is no single counter that will allow us to have one interlacement in every row distinct from the rest. We say that 6N satin is irregular satin because the counter must vary within each unit. In this example, we can see the counter is all over the place. It's 4 between the first two interlacements, 3 to the next, 2 to the next, 2 to the next after that, 
and then three, and then four. We are violating rule three, barring common factors, but it does ensure our other rules are obeyed within the unit. Take note of this sequence because we're going to need it in a moment. Okay, we have sat and figured out now and that's great as far as it goes. But for damask weavers, it's only part of the story. We create damask by flipping the weft and warp dominant bases wherever we want pattern to appear. Here's an example. This is a drawdown for six end irregular satin damask with two pattern blocks. The blue blocks exhibit the weft faced effect of our ground cloth and the orange blocks show the opposite. The technical term for this is counterchanging, and on a draw loom we achieve this effect by raising units that we want to appear as warp dominant and weaving them with a sinking shed. The question is, how should our tie-ups configure those units? As long as our satin counter has been deployed conscientiously in our ground cloth, we can locate units anywhere, and they are all a little different from one another. Can we flip any 6x6 six six square and give ourselves a good-looking pattern block? Is it really as simple as that? I'm afraid the answer is not really. And that is because we want our pattern blocks to exhibit clean cuts. Nice, well-defined edges on the units where pattern meets ground. We can't just pick any old 6x6 six six square on our ground cloth, call it a unit, and derive our tie-up accordingly. Ideally, our tie-up should satisfy two requirements. A balanced distribution of interlacements arranged as symmetrically as possible around the central point, and no binding points at the corners. Fortunately, there is a procedure we can follow so we don't have to do all this hunting and pecking with cutouts. Using our satin counters only, we can derive tie-ups suitable for damask on the draw loom using any satin variant we can think of. It's amazing. Let's see how it works. We'll use five end satin for our first exercise. We've already established our satin counters, which are two and three. I like the number three, so we'll use that in this example. The first thing we have to do is derive a series of five numbers using our counter of three as the interval between them. Eventually, these are going to become shaft numbers, so when we get to five, we'll need to double back. We'll start with 1. 1 plus 3 is 4. I'll write that down. 4 plus 3 is 7, but I need to start over when I get to 5. We'll just subtract 5 from 7 to give us 2. 2 plus 3 is 5. I start over and add 3. There's my sequence. Now, we need to reorder our sequence to ensure that our interlacements are balanced around a central point and absent from the corners of our eventual unit. We'll find two adjacent numbers that add up to one more than our unit count. In this case, our unit count is 5, so we're looking for two numbers that add up to 6. Here they are, 4 and 2. Let's draw a line between them. We are now going to reorder our sequence, starting with the number to the right of the line, which in this case is 2. When I get to the end, I'll double back and continue from 1. Here's my new sequence. 2, 5, 3, back to 1, 4. Okay. The final step is to enter these numbers on a 5x5 five five grid. To make it easier to see what we're up to, I've numbered it 1 to 5 across the bottom and 1 to 5 up the sides. Let's start with our first number here in column 1. Our first number is 2, so I'll make a mark here in row 2. Our second number is 5. I'll mark here in row 5. 3 goes here, then 1, then 4. Do you see what we've got? It's a tie-up box. My columns are now treadles and my rows are shafts. My circles are connections to rising shafts. On a draw loom, this is the tie-up for the interlacements in unraised, weft-dominant units. It's a great tie-up for satin damask ground. The warp end on my central shaft is bang in the middle and the two on either side are balanced fore and aft. There are no interlacements at the corners. By reordering around this pair, 
we have ensured neither our first nor last shafts appear at the ends of our sequence, and brought our middle shaft, three in this case, to the center. I like it. Let's also do a good ground tie-up for six-end satin. We know we don't have a single satin counter, but that's okay. We figured out our intervals earlier, and we'll use them to build our sequence. We'll start at one. One plus four is five. Five plus three is eight, which is really two. And so on until we've generated our sequence of six numbers. We find the two adjacent numbers that add up to seven and draw a line between them. We reorder our sequence starting with the number on the right, which is two in this case. And now we fill in our grid. In the first column, I make a mark in row two, because two is my first number. I work my way across the grid until I have a good, rising shed tie up. To summarize so far, for any given satin we can now work out our counter and thus derive a suitable tie up for our weft dominant ground cloth. The only thing left is to generate the tie up for our warp dominant pattern units, the ones that are woven with a sinking shed when they are raised by our draw looms pattern harness. Since we've gone through a lot of rigmarole to set ourselves up for success, this part is ridiculously easy. We take out our tie-up and add to it the tie-up for its mirrored opposite. The opposites are what guarantee our clean cuts. Here's a six-end satin drawdown to show how. In the middle is a unit of our weft dominant ground. If I imagine that I'm at my draw loom and have lifted the eight pattern units surrounding it, this is what I want to see in the woven cloth. See how every thread at the edge is interrupted, or cut, by a counterpart in the opposite face, here, 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 and here. The visual effect is to give us a clean square with no sticky out bits to spoil the shape of the unit. The generation of the opposite tie-up couldn't be easier. If you have good spatial relations, you could probably do it in your head. I have trouble doing that and use a transparency instead. Here's the box we filled in earlier. Since I mark my sinking shed tie-ups with X's, the first thing I will do is overlay my circles with X's I've already drawn. Now I take my transparency and flip it vertically. Where my X's fall, this is where I will mark the connections for the sinking shafts. Now that I've done it, I can see the relationships pretty clearly. I'm sticking with these numbers now, even though I usually reverse them at the loom. When shaft one goes down, shaft six goes up. When shaft six goes down, shaft one goes up. Shafts one and six are opposites. Let's draw a purple line between them as an aid memoir. Both these shafts are connected to treadles three and five, which have an opposite action. Shafts 5 and 2 are opposites. When shaft 5 goes down, 2 goes up. And when shaft 2 goes down, 5 goes up. We'll draw a gold line between those. Opposing treadles 1 and 6 are connected to shafts 2 and 5. Our last pair is shafts 3 and 4. When shaft 3 goes down, 4 goes up and when four goes down, three goes up. They get a red line. These two central shafts are connected to treadles two and four. This tie-up will guarantee clean cuts top to bottom and side to side. The only thing left now is to tie up our shafts and treadles. Because we are weaving on opposites with an even number of ground shafts, this is an ideal structure to weave on damask pulleys. If you've never seen such pulleys before, they look something like this. There's a hole at the top for threading the thing onto a counterbalance beam. Below, there are dividers that allow connections for shafts with opposite actions. At the bottom here, you can see the root of the first two connections. I've used red yarn to make it clear, but in the real world this would be a simple length of Texolve connected to the two central shafts. In the case of my tie-ups, 
These would be attached to shafts 3 and 4. Next is the gold connection to shafts 2 and 5. And finally, the purple connections to shafts 1 and 6. For this tie-up, I wouldn't need the rest of the cords, but you can see that this pulley would allow for up to 10 shafts in total. On the loom, we need our short lambs only to connect the sinking shafts. The pulleys take care of the opposite rising shafts automatically. So we only need our short lambs and one tie-up per treadle. This is what makes damask pulleys so attractive. They are simple, space-saving devices that facilitate the easiest tie-up in the world. There'd be nothing to stop you from using a countermarch for this structure, of course, but I love damask pulleys dearly and would use them all the time if I could. Many draw loom weavers do. So now we've done our six-end irregular satin tie-up from start to finish, and I think we're about ready to call it a day. But for the sake of due diligence, let's complete our five-end satin tie-up too. We start with the good tie-up for our ground cloth. We make our transparency, overlaying our O's with X's. We flip our transparency vertically to see where our opposites will fall. We ponder the beauty of clean-cut five-end satin damask. Or do we? If we were to use these tie-ups on a single harness loom, they'd work great because each pattern block would be assigned to its own array of five shafts and five treadles. But on a typical draw loom setup, with each treadle assigned to both a rising and sinking shaft, we've got a problem. This single connection at the center of our grid has no counterpart. Although the balanced tie-up is desirable for our ground cloth, this overlap on the central shaft is made impossible by our draw looms tie-up protocols. So now what do we do? Well, instead of tying up to the opposite warp dominant unit, we're going to tie up for a different one. Remember the hunting and pecking we did earlier? We're going to do that now. Here's the unit from which we derived our ground tie up. We simply shift our gaze to this unit, substitute our rising shafts for sinking shafts, and we're done. This will ensure that our central tie ups don't overlap. The easiest way to do this is to shift our transparency rather than flip it. Like this. One row is enough. Mm, we'll need to shift this tie up here to the bottom of the grid. Now all of our rising shafts have a sinking counterpart and the mechanics of our draw loom tie up will work, with each pair of uppy and downy shafts attached to the same treadle. But we are no longer weaving on opposites. On treadle 2, for example, shaft 1's counterpart is shaft 5, but on treadle 4, shaft 1's counterpart is shaft 2. Our damask pulleys will not work for 5-end satin. We need to haul our countermarch out from under the bed and use both sets of lambs. We have also broken our rule about having no interlacements in the corners. It's unavoidable given the alternative units we had at our disposal. And this procedure does affect the appearance of our pattern. We no longer have clean cuts on all four edges of our units. If we examine our unit on the drawdown, we can see how its outline has been transformed. Instead of the stark, clean cuts of 6 end satin, we have little rabbit ears and other oddities at the edges of our unit. This effect is interesting, almost like a shadow when viewed from a distance, and I think it's very attractive. I love it for weaving thicker cottons on my draw loom. So now we know how to construct a satin unit, generate a tie-up for damask, and rig our loom. We can follow this procedure for any satin variant, whether it's regular or irregular, with an even or odd number of shafts. We are empowered to design satin damask from first principles and set up our draw looms to weave it. But we've also raised some new questions. What exciting effects can we achieve when we ignore our satin counter? What if we want to mix structures on the same cloth, say satin and twill? In my next, much briefer video, we're going to explore some of these issues and look at ways we can use fiberworks to predict how our decisions will affect the look of our final cloth. I hope you'll join me.